Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Hello, and welcome to this Resurrection Day edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. You know, because of your overwhelming response, it's become a tradition for me to present a program each year at Easter that I call The Week That Changed the World. This week, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and also the Passover. And strangely enough, these two events are inseparably related. The week that changed the world took place in this time, and the feast, the Jewish feast of the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of the First Fruits actually set forth the whole scenario for that pivotal week in human history. In Exodus chapter 12, we find the first initiation of the Feast of Passover. It says, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Now that month is called the month of Nisan, and it corresponds roughly to the end of March, beginning of April in our calendar. So he says in verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, the month of Nisan, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households and a lamb for each household. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Now think about this for a moment. They were to take the lamb, they were to select a lamb without blemish, a perfect little lamb, and they were to take it with them into the house and observe it for four days until the 14th day. Now that means that this became a real object lesson to the children as well as to the adults because the little lamb became like a pet to the children. And they learned to love the precious little lamb. And then they saw that it had to be killed in order to deliver them from death. It was intended to be a great object lesson, and I'm sure it was. And it says, Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh the same night, roasted with fire. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. But you know, when applying the blood to the door in Exodus chapter 12, verse 22, it's very specific about how they were to apply this blood to the door. It says, And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, which was a kind of a plant that was common in the desert, and dip it in the blood, uh, which is in the basin, and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the, to the two doorpost, and none of you shall go outside the door of his household until morning. Now, stand in a doorway and pretend that you have this basin of blood with this bunch of hyssop. You dip it in the basin, and the lintel is the top of the doorway. You apply it first to the top of the doorway, then to the one doorpost, and then to the other doorpost. What did I just do? I made the sign of the cross. Now that was part of their routine for centuries. Now this was called the Passover because the angel said that whenever I see the blood on the door, I will pass over you and no death shall enter your house. And all through Egypt, the firstborn died that did not have the blood on the door. And God said, Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance, 
uh, gener uh, and seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now this is the institution of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now this is more specifically defined, uh, this feast, in Leviticus chapter 23, where it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as the holy convocations, my, uh, my appointed times are these, for six days work may be done, and on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. That was the institution of the weekly Sabbath. Then he says, these are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month, the month of Nisan, on the fourteenth day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Then on the fifteenth day of the same month, there is a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now on the first day of that seven days, on the fifteenth of the month, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. In other words, on the first day of the, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Sabbath. No matter which day it falls on, it's a Sabbath. Now let's apply these things to the week that Jesus of Nazareth acted out the fulfillment of these things in a way that changed the course of history. We'll look into that right after this. You know, as Easter approaches, I'm thinking about the resurrection and the need to know the certainty of it. The Apostle Peter even said that we should always be ready, speaking to all Christians, we should always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. You know, our hope is based on the fact and the certainty of our resurrection. This is a series that you must not miss. Certainty of Resurrection is a beautifully packaged set of four audio CDs. It can be yours for the low price of $29.95 plus shipping and handling. To order your copy of Certainty of Resurrection, write to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also order online at HalLindsay.com or by phoning 1-888-RAPTURE. Now we return to the week that changed the world. There's one fact that startled me when I was reading about the Feast of the Passover and how important it was to the last week of Jesus' life. And that is that the place of the Passover feast was changed by God from the home, wherever the Israelites were, specifically to only homes that are in Jerusalem. Listen to this. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 5 through 6. It says, You are not allowed to sacrifice the Passover in any of your towns which the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name, you shall sacrifice the Passover in the evening at sunset at that time that you came out of Egypt. Now, where he put his name? Jerusalem. So that's why uh, in the time Paul the Apostle, they strove so hard to get to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now, let's look at how the week that Jesus fulfilled the feast worked out so exactly. Now, the perimeters for the resurrection are very important here because this is going to upset a tradition that's very popular but very wrong called Good Friday. It couldn't have been Good Friday. It had to be Good Thursday. Now here's why. Jesus set this time in Matthew chapter 12 verses 38 through 40. He said, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. 
But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was in the three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now this corresponds exactly with a time schedule the Passover feast week sets up for these events that were celebrated by Israel for centuries unwittingly. All of this was a type of what would follow when Jesus the Messiah came. All right, let's go on that week that Jesus was there to the 10th of Nisan. Now what happened on the 10th of Nisan? They were to select a lamb without blemish and without spot as the one who would be sacrificed for the deliverance of the people. The tenth of Nisan fell on Palm Sunday that week. That was the day that Jesus, according to the precise timetable, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, had predicted. He came in and for the first time presented himself publicly as the Messiah and the heir apparent to the throne of David. Now, at that same time, God was selecting his Passover lamb for the world. Now, four days later, when in the feast of the Passover, the lamb was to be put to death. That was the day, on Passover day, it was the 14th of Nisan, which was a Thursday in that week. It began at sundown, according to the Jewish timetable, on Wednesday. And that was the evening, the evening of after sundown on Wednesday, which was actually their Thursday, that he sat down with his disciples and celebrated the Last Supper, the Passover feast. Now later that night, he went to the Mount of Olives, and in the middle of the night, he was taken prisoner and taken to be tried. Actually, he went through six trials all through the night. And then, after that, the day uh, he, he was executed at 9 a.m. and crucified, and that was the sacrifice of the real Passover lamb. And then at 3 p.m., he died. He screamed out to Telesti as he died, which means paid in full. The Lamb of God had paid in full for the sins of the world. And then he bowed his head and said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit and died by his own will. Now, after that, there were two members of the rulers of Israel who had uh, become believers, and they begged for the body of Jesus. Pilate granted them the body. Between 3 p.m. and sundown, they had to prepare his body for burial. And it tells us in John chapter 9, verses 38, following exactly how they did this, according to the custom of the Jews, which they got from Egypt, they used approximately two-inch strips of linen, and it says they used a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes to coat these linen wrappings, and they wrapped each limb, his torso, and uh, everything but the head, and coated them with myrrh and aloes. You see, myrrh was an aromatic, very pungent spice that had the consistency of shellac. Aloes was a powdered sachet, which they sprinkled on him. Now just remember, it was like shellac, and it would dry very hard and hold those bandages like a mummy. All right, now, they put him in the tomb before sundown, and that was on Thursday. Now, as the 15th of Nisan began, which was sundown on our Thursday, they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
And, uh, of course, the day before the Passover day was called the day of preparation. They had to remove all leaven from the house. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's uh, commanded in Leviticus 23, verses 6 and 7. It says, Then on the fifteenth day of the same month, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. Now, what is that? It's a Sabbath. So that means that on sundown of Thursday, which became Friday, they had a Sabbath. Now, what does this mean? It means there were the Sabbath, there was the Sabbath on Friday and the Sabbath on Saturday back to back. Now, why is that important? Because if Jesus was crucified on Friday, he could never have stayed within the perimeters that Jesus himself laid down for how many days he had to be in the grave. You see, the Passover day was the first day. He died and was put in the tomb. Then the 15th of Nisan, which was Friday, was the first, uh, second day he was in the tomb. And then that was a Sabbath. Then there was a regular Sabbath on Saturday. That was the third day he was in the tomb until the sundown of Saturday. So that would have been the third night, the third day. Sometime after sundown, in the middle of the night, Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, what feast was that? You see, on the... Uh, 17th of that week was the Feast of First Fruits. And this was a feast that celebrated that there was going to be a true harvest. And they offered the first fruits to the Lord. That was a picture that Jesus was to be the first fruits of humanity that was raised from the dead bodily and translated into an eternal new a mortal body. So that sets the week that changed the world and it was a week that completely changed man's prospective future because of the week when provision for sin was made and all who put their trust in the Lamb of God the Passover lamb, his blood is applied to us and God sees that blood and he passes us over and he gives us eternal life. How beautiful all of these feasts that Israel celebrated, there were seven of them, but these spelled out the first and most important timetable for the week that changed the world. I want to apply the significance of the resurrection, which is the highlight of the week that changed the world. I'm going to focus on one of the really important evidences of the resurrection called the undisturbed grave clothes. You know, there is uh, an incident described in John chapter 19, verses 38 through chapter 20, verse 9 that lays out one of the strangest and most powerful evidences that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. In chapter 19, I mentioned before that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were both members of the ruling Sanhedrin, they had come to believe in him, they were the ones who prepared Jesus' body for the grave. And they had a shroud that they took him from the cross to the uh, nearby tomb, which had a great, huge rock that would be rolled in place to close the tomb. And it was there they took this shroud off and they wrapped him in these linen bandages. And remember, myrrh was like shellac. And they used almost 100 pounds of that with some powdered sachet called aloes mixed in with it. Now we go to the 
chapter 20, verse 1 of John, and we read, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That was the apostle John, who, by the way, was a young teenager, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Of course, he was a teenager, faster. Verse 5, stooping down and looking in, Peter saw, I'm sorry, stooping down and looking in, John saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Verse 6, and so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, John, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered. Now listen to this. He saw, that is the linen wrappings Jesus had been in, and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must first rise again from the dead. Now, it's, you know, the Greek language is much more explicit and much, much more elastic. There's so many more words you can use to get across an exact point. And you don't see that in the English because in the first reference in verse 5 where it says that uh, John uh, first came to the tomb and he stooped down looking and he saw the linen wrappings. Now this word is blepi, from blepo, which means to look at something, but just to observe it, not to understand it. And so that's the first word that she is, blepo. And then it says in verse 6, and Peter came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw, but there's a different Greek word. It's Theoro, theori, or theoreo, comes from that. We get the word theory from that in English. In other words, this means to see and to study and, and to see theorizing. What is this? What's its significance? What does it mean? So he was questioning what it meant, but he didn't understand. And then in verse uh, 8, it says, so the other disciple... Uh, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw, and this is a word, Aiden, from Hara'o, which means to see and to understand what you're seeing, to perceive and understand. And it says that John looked at these linen wrappings, and this time he understood what they meant. And because of what he saw, he believed in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says he did this before anyone understood the scripture of the Old Testament that Jesus must rise again from the dead. Now the question is, what did he see that was so powerful that it convinced him a miracle had taken place, that something supernatural had taken place? Well, it all is answered when you go back to the former page where in John 19, it describes how burial was prepared. You see, the Jews had learned the idea of mummy preparation from the Egyptians when they were there. What John saw was the perfect shape of Jesus' body, but no body in it. In other words, that myrrh, like shellac, had dried and held these bandages in the exact shape of the body of Jesus, like a cocoon. But there was no body in it. Of course, they never wrapped the head. They put a embro beautiful embroidered cloth over the face when they buried. So 
he saw a headless cocoon and he could look and see there was no nothing inside of it but it was still in the precise exact shape of the body of Jesus so he realized it would take a miracle to remove the body without disturbing one centimeter of those linen wrappings and that he put together with the fact that a miracle had taken place and as Jesus had predicted he came out of the tomb bodily alive you see we know later that he could go right through a wall while his body just came miraculously right through those bandages right through the wall the tomb was later opened by the angels to show the world not to let him out but to show the world he was already gone now as a result of this that was not taken away religious and and uh, uh, Jewish authorities as well as Roman authorities with a short walk could come to this tomb and check out the tomb and see this evidence the book of Acts declares that many came to be believers among even the leaders of Israel. And I'm sure that this was one of the supporting evidences that showed there had to have been a resurrection or something supernatural take place. As we celebrate Resurrection Day this week, let's remember the week that was and put our faith in Jesus as our Savior. Well, folks, may the truth of the resurrection really grip you so that you'll understand that now you need never fear death again, for it's only removing the veil. Well, that's it for tonight. God bless you, and God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.